All right, good morning, traders. My name is Christopher Vecchio, Senior Currency Strategist with Daily FX. Today is Tuesday, April 25th, 2017. I'm here joined by Martin Essex, analyst and editor of Daily FX, and Nick Colley, a market analyst for Daily FX, for our European roundtable or Daily FX European desk roundtable discussion. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Chris. Morning, Chris. Morning, Martin. We're here today to talk about FX markets in the wake of the French elections that just occurred this past Sunday. Before we get started, if I could just get a quick confirmation that you can see my screen and hear our voices, we will be happy to jump right in right away. And I see that people are saying we are good to go, so appreciate that already. Just a reminder that if you're looking for trade-specific insight, please include your entry stop and time frame. We'd like to know where you've gotten into the market, where your risk lies, and of course, what your point of view is. Most of us our are, excuse me, long-term traders. So, uh, if you are, say, a scalper, help us help you by providing a little bit more detail or color to your trade, if possible. That way, we know to adjust our analytical framework. Um, beyond that, please be aware that any opinion that we disseminate is our opinion and ours alone. It does not constitute trade advice on behalf of Daily Effects or IG Group, so please don't treat it as such. Um, with that said, we are looking at a different FX landscape than we were this time last week. The dollar index is considerably weaker, mainly thanks in part to its largest component, the euro, which is 57.6% of the dollar index, trading considerably higher. Now up at 109, or excuse me, 108.84, euro dollar has enjoyed a gap open to start this week on the back of those French election results on Sunday. And Boy, if there was any doubt about polling or the state of the polling career vocation, I think that went out the window with this set of results that we just got out of the French election on Sunday. Uh, Martin and Nick, I'll throw it up to both of you. Do you think that we're looking at an outcome where the French elections kind of fell so closely on the nose that in reality, the markets were not pricing in necessarily a surprise about the French election, but they were pricing in this possibility that the polls had it completely wrong ahead of time, which is why the well, euro traded so well before then. Well, it would be no surprise, would it, if the markets thought that pollsters couldn't be trusted as they've got it so wrong so many times previously. But on this uh, occasion, as you said, it was absolutely spot on. The markets got precisely what the pollsters said that they were going to get. I think it's fair to say, though, that, that there was a great deal of uncertainty. The market certainly um, thought that uh, the result could be uh, worse than it was, and so there was a relief rally. I think the downside would have been much larger if, uh, if they hadn't got this result. Uh, yeah, um, it, it was a kind of a, 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 the expected result. Um, Mélenchon, who was the, the the person who came well, literally from left field in the last two weeks, you know, sort of racked up some good numbers, taking it from a sort of three horse race into a two horse race. Uh, sorry, a four horse, a three horse into a four horse race. But I think it was always going to be the case um, that it was going to be the, the sort of. The, the Macron versus Le Pen runoff in the second round. Um, I think the markets have taken it fairly well, um, but as you know, as with all these things, I mean, we have got some political risk going into the into the second round, uh, and also you have to sort of wonder what the policies of Macron are, are going to be if he gets uh, gets elected. Uh, and if he's going to be actually going to be able to do anything with these policies, or if he's going to have to start sort of taking uh, other parties on board. As we've written before, um, the, the big risk coming up now is not so much the um, the second round of the election in May, but the um, French Assembly elections in June. Because if um, if uh, he's to govern, if Macron is to govern, he's going to need the support of the Legislative Assembly. And if uh, if his party on March doesn't do as well as uh, it, 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 as well as it could do, there's certainly a possibility that the Assembly will be against him, and he'll be completely stuck. He won't be able to put his policies into practice. Yeah, absolutely, and, and I think you know if you've we've seen the rise in the, say, for example, the CAC yesterday sort of jumped four percent. The euro sort of um, put on a good performance as well. 
Um, but you, you know, we're going to have to start looking at uh, policies, and as, as Martin was saying, there, uh, the ability to rule and actually get these policies put through. So the risk is that there is a, a, a prime minister that comes from a different party than Emmanuel Macron. Those French legislative elections are June 11th to 18th, if I recall correctly. And right now, it seems that the most likely outcome, given what the polls are saying, is that. Uh, the two more traditional establishment parties, the Republican Party, which is uh, Francois Fillon's party, and the Socialist Party, which is uh, Benoit Hamon's party, they'll be the ones who actually retain most of the power um, on a legislative basis across the country. So um, right now, do you think that the Euro-dollar rally is less to do with this idea that France is all of a sudden going to lead a, uh, a new path forward in the EU and more to do with this idea that Marine Le Pen is just not going to be in charge and be able to pull France out of the EU? It's, it's certainly true that um, what we could face now is the situation that you quite often get in America where the president is stuck by, um, is, is stopped from doing what he wants to do by, by a Congress that doesn't support him. So that's exactly the same as could happen in France. Um, but it's certainly, I think, clear that um, uh, if you can believe the polls, that Marine Le Pen doesn't really stand much of a chance of getting through. And that's certainly a big relief. Whether um, the, the Cacaron can continue to rise from here, of course, is another matter entirely. It seems to me that this was a, a jump that was much larger than expected so you might expect some pullback at some point anyway. Yeah I mean I'd, I'd agree with that. I, mean, I think what you've, you're, you're probably going to see in the, in the second round of voting is it's maybe not so much a, a vote for Macron but it's going to be a vote against Le Pen. Uh, so I, I, think, I think you're going to get a lot of negative voting um, and this should you know, obviously you know give Macron the uh, sort of should give him a, sort of a fairly clear path through to the presidency. I think that's really important to differentiate that that Macron himself, you know, to kind of just poke fun at the the situation, if if you would allow me to do so. How much do people need to hate Marine Le Pen that the left wing or center left party is embracing an investment banker as their candidate? I mean, that just to me is just so obtuse. It, it, it's kind of like the Democrats nominating Hillary Clinton in the United States. Um, and, you know, to an extent, you know, Macron is promising more of the same. He's saying that, you know, for better or worse, that he draped himself in the EU flag going into this election and, and he carried it on his shoulders very willingly. Yes, the EU is the problem. Not. He's not an outsider in the way that some people have been describing him. They've been talking about him as a political outsider. They've been talking about him as an independent. He's not really either of those things. Um, for a start, he went to this elite college that French um, political leaders and civil servants go to. And he was also um, an economy minister. So he's, he's certainly not the outsider. He's very much establishment. And I think that's why the traditional parties, both the Republicans and the Socialist Party, are going to support him. Because it's not as though he's someone who's who's come completely out of the blue in the way that, um, in the way that uh, Donald Trump did. He's someone who they know, who they've worked with. And I think that's why they're going to support him. It's not not just an anti-national front, anti-Le Pen vote. It's also a vote for the establishment, the way things are in France. Well, to just clear something up, I, should we call it the anti-national front vote anymore? Le, Marine Le Pen did step down as the head of the party last night. She's trying to paint herself as the Charles de Gaulle candidate of France. I think it's all nonsense and voters are smarter than that and will look through her political tricks personally. Yeah, maybe maybe she's just trying to sort of take the, the Front National uh, name out of the actual election. Um, maybe that's tainted. Maybe she feel, realizes that that may cause her problem getting votes. And, and so, yeah, so she's going to maybe just take that name out of the, out of the picture and, and hope that people don't see through that. Right. And we had a saying, if it talks like a duck and walks like a duck, just because it doesn't want to be called a duck doesn't mean that it's not a duck. Um, kind, of, kind of pivoting here, we, we've seen a market reaction where risk seems to have, uh, uh, the risk of the market, generally speaking, seem to have abated. One of my favorite measures to look at when we're talking about broader measures of market risk is the relationship between, say, gold and uh, the yen and U.S. yields. And since at least mid-March, we can call it March 13th or so, 
we've seen that yields in the United States and gold in the yen have moved more or less in tandem. I'm putting up the, the inverted U.S. 10-year Treasury yield here, so higher blue line would mean lower yields, lower blue line would mean higher yields, and putting up yen dollar, this purple line here, so higher purple line, stronger yen, weaker, or lower purple line, weaker yen. Um, something of interest in the last few days is around this French election result is that U.S. yields have come up. We've seen the dollar yen increase once more, and as a result, gold's coming off. Uh, do you think this is something that's going to more or less weigh in on the Fed's ability to hike rates, or do you think that international concerns are really, you know, an issue non grata for the Fed, that this is something that they really couldn't care less about one way or the other? There are more pressing issues to deal with with the U.S. economy and the state of Donald Trump's policy prognostications at the moment. Maybe, Chris, I could actually throw that back to you because we've got this big speech by Trump tomorrow, haven't we, in which he's going to outline supposedly his um, fiscal policies. Um, from here, from this side of the Atlantic, we're looking at political risk, and political risk seems to be pretty much the only thing that matters. But of course, if you're trading a currency, the other side of the pair matters a huge amount, and I'm wondering what you think that uh, we could expect from Trump, because I think that's going to be just as important now as the politics. I mean, if we're going to talk about it from that equation, my number one thing this week is looking for steps to avoid a U.S. government shutdown. Back in October 2015, as part of the jostling between the Democratic President Barack Obama and the Republican-led Congress, uh, they passed a continue, continuing resolution bill that would keep the government open and funded until April 2017. Now, there was some budgetary measures and loopholes that the current Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin uh, levied earlier to keep the government up and running, but now we're kind of at the end of that deadline where the Treasury has exhausted its cash reserves, and if the government does not pass a spending bill by 12.01 a.m. Eastern Time in New York, so I guess that'd be uh, 5.01 London Time on Saturday morning, then the U.S. government will, in effect, shut down. Um, we just saw news last night, and I put this article up in the real-time news feed, but Donald Trump is apparently backing off some of his promises, threats, I don't know how you want to you know, phrase it, depending upon what angle you're looking at, that the U.S. budget that would be set forward would have to contain uh, a spending provision for a border wall. The fact that he's willing to back off some of these let's say, campaign promises and, and, and compromise, if you will, I think dramatically reduces the probability of a U.S. government shutdown. And if that's the case, then the dollar probably doesn't have that, you know, tail risk scenario cropping up at the end of this week, and maybe the dollar can rally a little bit more. But in terms of everything else, I have no optimism whatsoever that in the next four days, even though it's a, you know, one party controlling everything government, that they'll be able to pass health care reform, which would allow them to open up this tax savings for tax reform, and they'll be able to do both of those in a non-cantankerous manner that would allow for parties to come together to solve this government shutdown issue before it occurs on Saturday morning at 12.01 Eastern Time. So I think regardless of what he says tomorrow, um, can you really take it all that seriously? Well, you know, healthcare was supposed to be, you know, the biggest and best thing ever that was changed, and it never was. It still hasn't been yet. Um, all these things that were supposed to happen in the first hundred days simply haven't happened. Mm -hmm. It's kind of astonishing that even though one party controls everything, you know, for example, when Obama was president, a Democrat, the Republican Congress voted 60 times or so to repeal and replace Obamacare. 60 times, and they have not done anything yet in the first 100 days. So to me, it's just total political artifice, and I don't think the market is really pinning its hopes on anything that's going to come out tomorrow. And already I've spoken to people, and they said, uh, I have a friend, a close friend who works as an aide on Capitol Hill, and he's been saying to me the last 24 hours that uh, you know a continuing resolution for at least one week is a probable outcome. Um, they don't really see how you know, tomorrow is going to result in more than just like a, a political wish list of things that Donald Trump would like to see get done in the next hundred days, if you will. 
So that would imply that in the market, at least, it's it's U.S. risk that, that perhaps we need to look out for, rather than um, European risk. If you're looking at um, euro dollar cable, even dollar yen, the driver could actually be the, um, the the dollar rather than the the other side of the equation. And I'm wondering also um, if the markets are going to start worrying about the U.S. midterm elections next year, in which uh, Congress could turn out to be um, even more opposed to Trump than it is already. Yeah, I mean, that's something that we got to look out for. Everyone's saying, no, oh, the midterms are so far away. I mean, look, we're on the doorstep of, of May right now. We're a quarter of the way through the period between the 2016 presidential elections and the 2018 midterm elections. Yeah, time is going by fairly fast at present moment. So um, if, if, if Trump isn't able to get these things done now, uh, before we kind of get sucked into that vortex of the next election. So, you know, being realistic, let's say we got to wait until the calendar to hit 2018. But if they don't get tax reform done, they don't get health care reform done, they don't get infrastructure spending done, then the path forward for the dollar is really difficult. That's really the whole premise of the dollar rally that happened after November, that we would see this Republican-led Congress give legislation to the Republican president that he could just sign into law, uh, there would be significant tax reform where it would reduce the tax burden on businesses and consumers, which would free up disposable income that they could put back into the economy. And you couple that with an infrastructure spending bill, and all of a sudden you have the ingredients there, more government spending and fewer taxes, to increase budget deficits. Typically speaking, when you see budget deficits increase in developed economies around the world, uh, you typically get inflation. And with that inflation, you would get the necessity for the Federal Reserve to raise rates sooner than they previously anticipated. Now, yeah, if I mean, those things don't uh, materialize, then where's the dollar going to rally from? I think he just, I think he nudged it there, actually. I, I think you've really got to start looking back to the FOMC on this. As you said, you know, Donald Trump uh, is finding it difficult to pass through. You know, his first hundred days, he's effectively done nothing. Um, it, you know, it's not like running a, a company, it's, it's a country and it's a completely different dynamic. I think you're going to have to look really, for, for, for any dollar support, you're going to have to look back to the FOMC. Uh, and I think that will have a, a quite a direct bearing on where the, where the where, where cable goes for a start or any other sort of dollar pair goes. Um, it's, it's, it's all very well looking ahead to the future and for the, for the, all these changes which may not happen until 2018 but we've had such a big rally on the on the, on the hopes that all these things are going to happen you know it, it, for, for the dollar to be propped up the, I think the FOMC needs to uh, uh, yeah be a little bit more clearer about where it's going it just seems from this point of view then that the, the risk of the dollar I mean on a technical basis just from my charts here we're at a pretty dangerous point in time right now. We're kind of cracking onto that trend line from the May, June, August 2016 lows here. And it's occurring right as we're seeing price break down through this swing level uh, from the October 16 high and then December 16, January 17, March 17 lows. This kind of support resistance band that's been in play for the last, say, we'll call it six months. We're starting to slip through there. We're starting to push towards this trend line right now. You know, it, it, to me, it would just anything that shows that the Federal Reserve is not going to be able to hike along the timeline that they've kind of laid out or faster would be a serious knock against the greenback. And and I know that from the last FOMC minutes, um, the the reading between the lines was more or less the Fed saying we'd like to hike in June, we'd like to hike in September, we really want to start to wind down our balance sheet as well this year. Which, if you think about it, because their balance sheet asset repurchases right now are buying mortgage-backed securities, which the underlying asset is mortgage, which are tied to long-term bond yields. You figure that if banks aren't able to unload or the securitized uh, 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 assets to the Federal Reserve, then the underlying asset they'd be less willing to make those loans out on. So in theory, the Fed ending their asset repurchase program, long story short, should revol result in long-end U.S. yields going up, which could be a benefit for the dollar as interest rate differentials widen out. But, you know, if that doesn't happen this year, the Fed only hikes once more, the dollar could be in a good deal of trouble from yeah, my vantage point. And, and, yeah. and the euro and the pound, as you said, 
are probably well positioned to take advantage of that as political risk seems to be evaporating out of the Eurozone and the UK right now, left and right. I think we yeah. also ought to mention um, North Korea, which is um, lo looks to be very dangerous at the moment. And um, uh, you've got uh, this um, uh, missile firing and live firing drills and so forth. Um, U.S. carriers heading towards the country. And it seems to me that, that the currency most at risk there is probably the Japanese yen, because Japan, of course, is not all that far away from uh, North Korea. It's within reach of its missiles. And I think that um, there could even though one thinks of the Japanese yen as a, as a haven currency, a safe haven, I think there's a good chance that people will actually not want to um, buy Japanese yen, but will want to look for other safe havens, um, such as the Swiss franc and gold. So that's another dynamic here that's going on, I think. Yeah, I think um, if, you, if you look at the dollar against the euro, the, 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 the eurozone economy is in a, in a fairly good place at the moment. You know, X inflation, uh, the Eurozone economy, all the, all the numbers that have been coming out, all the hard data that's been coming out over the last few months, shows that the Eurozone's in quite a good place. And if we do see this set up in, 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 the, uh, in the dollar, because uh, expectations have been very, very high uh, over the last few months, I think the Euro could uh, perform against it. Yes, I mean, the, the alternatives are we don't much like the dollar for why, for the reasons that Chris was saying. We don't much like the yen for the reasons I was saying. It looks as though the euro and possibly sterling are, are the currencies of choice at the moment on a long-term basis. Right, we have an expression for it. It's, it's, a, it's, it's there's some of the few good houses in a bad neighborhood, right? There's not a lot of appealing factors here, you know, because of all the risks that are surrounding some, some of the major currencies, but it's kind of... You know, speaking because currencies are a game of relativity, which currencies are in, you know, for lack of a better phrasing, less worse shape than others right now. And certainly along that spectrum, it seems that the dollar has a lot of risk tied, tied to it right now. Yeah, the Japanese yen has a lot of risk tied to it right now. Um, but, yeah, as, as Nick pointed out, the data coming out of the Eurozone has actually been quite good. It just seems that there is a, a narrative here that is kind of taking control out of the Eurozone, and that's something that really is working against some of these, you know, European currencies. If it's, you know, Brexit's going to be terrible or uh, uh, the, e the European Central Bank is still easing, um, those seem to be the driving factors when in reality, you know, if you kind of take away the, the hope and, and the dreams here of what's been going on with U.S. fiscal policy, then you can kind of see how maybe the dollar doesn't look that great after overall. Um, I, I do want to pivot here because we have yet to touch on this issue and we didn't meet last week, certainly the announcement came last week. Uh, but you guys seem to be familiar with the situation. Snap elections in the UK are coming up now on June 8th. What do you think this is by Prime Minister uh, Theresa May? What, what's the whole point of her sh shifting to snap elections here as the Brexit process gets underway? I think it's just she's um, she's she's strengthening her position. I mean, it's a good time for for the Conservatives uh, or the ruling party you know, to to call a snap election. Uh, their majority at the moment uh, is is fairly small, but this this will give them, uh, you know, if polls are to be believed, um, this will give them quite a strong uh, majority in, in the House. Um, they will be able to go into Brexit or Theresa May will be a little bit more emboldened. Um, any problems that she may have in the House passing uh, legislation and stuff, she'll let us have a much stronger hand uh, and be able to quell some of these situations. I think overall, I mean, it, it's it's a good um, it, it's a good time to call it. It's it's caused a bit of a problem, and people are saying that Theresa May said that she wouldn't call a general election, but you know. I think anything that strengthens the UK hands going into negotiations with the EU is a good thing to do. For the one thing the UK markets want is they want to avoid this idea of a, a cliff edge. They don't want um, the UK to be in the European Union one day and out the next. So what this does, if May wins, is, is it strengthens her hand so that she can reach a negotiated settlement. Um, she doesn't want to have to put the, um, the agreement to the House of Commons because the House of Commons might say, no, we don't like it, go back and renegotiate. If she has a strong enough hand in Parliament, right. which she's likely to do, after this um, election, then um, all that's avoided. She doesn't have to have another vote. She can just say, we've reached an agreement. Now here it is. Yep. 
that seemed to me to be the, the, the issue when the House of Commons kind of made, or the, excuse me, the House of Lords um, passed that resolution. I think it was back in February or March saying that there would need to be a final Brexit vote. It's just the fact that there's only a two-year negotiating window, if they get to, say, January 2019 and all of a sudden Parliament turns around and rejects the agreement that Theresa May made with the EU, what outcome is there left? There's really not enough time to negotiate a new settlement. So I do agree that this opens up a possibility where Theresa May can kind of have unity behind her and the message that she's getting across, and Parliament would be much more uh, likely to agree with the final outcome there. Um, do you think that this, however, means that, you know, for the, you know, I hate all these terms that we use or that we throw around like Frexit and Brexit and, you know, hard and soft, but do you think that because of a potential larger majority that she may hold now in Parliament with the Tories, this will ultimately mean she is less beholden to the hardline Brexiteers, allowing for a softer Brexit or easier negotiating period of time? It, it, it may do. Yeah, 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 it's a good point. It, it, it may do, but I think what, as, as we've been saying, I think what it does is it gives her conviction and uh, to do what she believes is right and what the electorate have, uh, have asked for. All the talk about sort of soft and hard Brexit, we still really don't know what's going on yet. We, you know, we, we have no clarity. Um, I think Theresa May meets um, Juncker and um, Barnier are tomorrow uh, to start all, you know, to have their sort of uh, first meetings and stuff like that and just have a chat. But we, we, we really don't know this, this soft and hard Brexit. The EU could quite, quite easily turn around and say, we'll give you this. You know, it's it's not beyond the realms of possibility. Or you know, we'll give you that, and so all these sort of these terms that we're using, hard and soft, may become irrelevant overall. Um, but as I said, we, the stronger Theresa May feels going into these negotiations, I think Europe will take that on board. And by and large, the the the, the, the UK markets generally um, like the Conservatives. So the more power that the Conservatives get, um, uh, the more that's likely to support um, not just the pound but London share prices as well. So mm -hmm. the markets want a big majority; they're likely to get a majority, and that's another thing that will support um, UK assets uh, over the next few months. Well said. So shifting gears here, I want to turn to the economic calendar for what's coming up this week because there are a number of significant uh, data points that are due in the days ahead. Um, right now, I think probably the thing that we'll be wanting to watch for among the next few days, among the high-rated events, would be that ECB meeting on Thursday. What are your thoughts on the ECB meeting this Thursday, Martin? Oh, they're not going to do anything at all. Um, they've made it entirely clear that that um, uh, easy monetary policy in the eurozone is here to um, to stay pretty much indefinitely. Um, there's been talk about tapering, in other words, reducing the monetary stimulus. Um, but the latest thinking on that is that we're probably not going to get any sort of tapering until next year. I mean, we're talking about 2018, and that's just withdrawal of some of the monetary stimulus. Um, if you're looking at interest rates um, uh, moving uh, moving upwards, uh, probably 2019. So in market terms, this is way, way into the future. I don't think that there's any chance that anything is going to change probably for the rest of this year. Yeah, I think if you, if you look on actually on the calendar you've got there, you've got sort of underneath the ECB, you've got the, you know, the German consumer price. Uh, and, and I think this is the only problem that the Euro at the moment or the Eurozone has. Uh, with, German, with German inflation on the rise, the Germans and um, Schäuble has already been um, vocal in this in the press and on, on, on the web and so on. Uh, you know, they they want monetary stimulus to be reduced. They want rates to go up. They're worried about inflation in Germany. Um, so I think the only thing that will be giving Mario Draghi some kind of headache would be um, the sort of calls from Germany for higher rates, for reduced stimulus, um, and, and those calls, if German inflation, you know, if we're looking at there to touch 1.9%, you know, if it starts to hit 2% and it starts to stay there on a sustained basis, then the calls from Germany for, you know, uh, tightening monetary policy will only become louder. 
But it's become a sort of Punch and Judy show, hasn't it, Nick, with um, with uh, Schäuble saying, well, we want higher interest rates and um, Draghi yeah. saying, no, you can't have them and Schäuble coming back again. It, it's, it's, it's almost not in something you can take very seriously. I don't think that whatever Germany wants on this, and we tend to think of Germany as being all powerful in the Eurozone, it's just not going to happen because there's too many other countries that, that really, really don't want monetary policy to be tightened. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's, the, it's the divide between the North and the South in, the, in Europe. You know, one's doing well and one's not. Again, it comes back to the, the currency. You know, one size does not fit all. And it's, but it, it will start to be shown more. And uh, as you say, you know, we have this sort of sideshow, sort of ECB versus uh, Schäuble at the moment. Um, but the only thing that that will do, that, that will cause a little bit of anxiety in the market. So uh, my, my general point about these... Uh, ECB meetings is, is really something that I make about the Fed and what's going on with the BOE and the RBNZ. All these central banks kind of in an effort to become predictable and reliable from the market's point of view have become totally transparent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, none of these major central banks have done anything at meetings in which they haven't announced changes to their economic forecast. I mean, we call it Super Thursday for the BOE. Um, with the Federal Reserve, it's their summary of economic projections. With the ECB, it's the staff economic projections. I don't know why they're both called SEPs and mean different things. Um, with the, the, the RBNZ, it's the monetary policy report. The central banks, they don't, at least over the last three years, they haven't changed policy in a significant manner unless it's been at a meeting in which they've had these new growth and inflation and labor market forecasts. So as this meeting is one of the meetings in which there won't be new SEPs out of the ECB, to me, if they were to make an adjustment to policy without presenting, you know, the set of reasons as to why they think the economy would be shifted from the previous point of view, it would only introduce uncertainty to markets. And that's something that policymakers everywhere are trying to avoid. Um, Friday, when we turn to the calendar, we also have a pretty heavy slate of GDP data due out. The UK GDP, the Canadian GDP, and the US GDP on Friday. Um, just briefly on the US GDP, 1.1% from 2.1, terrible. Not really surprised though. This has kind of been the case in the first quarter every single year since the financial crisis. You know, this idea of residual seasonality is in play where there's like a data hangover, uh, for lack of a better term, that statisticians just can't really figure out why when they compute first quarter GDP figures, there always seems to be lower than any other quarter during the rest of the year. It's really an outlier for the United States. Um, but with that, that UK GDP figure coming up on, on Friday, what do you think the upside risk there is for the pound? Do you think that we're kind of in the situation now where because inflationary pressures are starting to crop up in the UK, if we see higher growth ratings, the BOE might have its hand forced? Or is the BOE still stuck in this mindset that it needs to remain this apolitical institution and, and it can't risk looking like it's reacting to the Brexit situation just yet. I wouldn't like to be a, a member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee at the moment because you've got, at the same time, you've got rising inflation, or at least rising inflation expectations, but you've got an economy that does seem to be slowing. So if we get quarterly growth, quarter on quarter, of say 0.4% against the previous 0.7%, what does the bank do about a slowing economy at the same time as you have rising inflation? And that's why we're all expecting um, UK interest rates to remain exactly where they are for a very long time now. Um, if they in, if they intervened to um, uh, to try and combat inflation by raising interest rates, there'd be an outcry. If they did something to um, uh, to reduce interest rates to try and help the economy, there'd be an outcry. So they're just going to sit on their hands and. Uh, Again, that's not likely to change anytime soon. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with that. It's um, you know, growth is slowing down, but even at 0.4 percent, if it comes, if that's what it comes in, the first reading comes in on Friday, it's still a reasonable uh, first quarter rate. Um, you know, the first the the first reading is only about 44 percent of uh, the available data. Um, so even though it gives you a, a good idea of where GDP, uh, first quarter GDP is, it can be liable to, to revisions anyhow. 
And right, of course, we're looking backwards, aren't we? I mean, this is this is what's happened. It's not what's um, what's ha what's going to happen in the future. I mean, I'd, I'd much rather look at uh, indicators like the PMIs to see the future rather than looking at GDP. I know we place a lot of emphasis on GDP, but it really is looking in the rearview mirror of the car, isn't it? It's it's what's where we've been, not where we're going. And so I think that's why um, if you're trading, you need to look at PMIs and other forward-looking indicators rather than at things like uh, GDP and employment. Right, and the situation that you guys have described is the pol uh, policy untenable one known as stagflation where you're faced with uh, low growth and high inflation and you know if you raise rates to combat high inflation then you risk choking off growth and if you keep rates low or you cut rates to aid uh, the growth situation then you risk exacerbating the inflationary issue. So it's uh, it's not something that you would like to be faced with as a monetary policy maker. Um, let's put this into market terms though. Where do we think the pound setting over the next few months? I, I, I mean, I'm partial to think that it's set to run higher and I'm looking at a scenario where it could run all the way up towards, you know, mid 134s here. But what are your takes? Mm. Yeah, it's going to take something to push it there, um, uh, or it's going to take a very weak dollar. I think to get it up to that level, I can. I mean, chart-wise, it, it it seems it seems very possible, but I think if it, if it does get there, it's going to, it'll be a very a very gradual crawl up there. I don't think you're going to see any, any any sharp moves at the moment, especially when you've got the sort of Brexit overhang. Well, famously, that chart that you're showing there, um, in theory, shows um, a head and shoulders bottom, doesn't it? It shows that um, this is a, a reversal pattern and, and you would expect prices to go higher. But I think it's also very interesting that we haven't really seriously broken through that neckline yet. I mean, I know it is above it on that chart, but there's no cons I don't think that's a strong enough rise above that uh, uh, neckline to suggest that we really are going very sharply higher yet. Do you think that there are other pairs that the pound is better suited to rally against than the U.S. dollar right now, or you know, as we were saying previously, because of how the dollar and the yen are, are truly, you know, two pairs here that are you know, kind of dealing with these existential risks right now. If it's nuclear annihilation in Japan or uh, Trump annihilation in the United States, um, you know, the FOMC may not be able to raise rates as they want to see fit, and Japan may not become a safe haven may lose that appeal rather quickly if war breaks out on the Korean Peninsula. Do you think that the yen and the dollar are the best places to express a pound bullish aspect or do you think maybe it's it's something else? To me that looks like a stronger chart. I mean that, that really does look to me as though it's broken out from that, yeah. uh, that that trend line. That really does look technically at least pretty strong and so we're sort of heading up for that um, for that high we got uh, we got back in December which uh, seems to me to be a fairly reasonable target. Yeah, I'd agree. I think the I think if you if you're bullish on the pound, you, you you'd you'd go against the yen. I think that's the sort of the much clearer picture. Um, yeah, I don't think. Okay, Martin, yeah, we've mentioned about sort of uh, the political risks, but that that'll be fairly well flagged up if there are going to be any sort of major problems. So yeah, if you if you're bullish on the pound, I think you should be really looking against the yen. Well, gentlemen, uh, this was an interesting discussion. I enjoy having these, and we'll be back in the next weeks to continue these discussions. We hold these discussions every Tuesday morning at 6 Eastern, 10 GMT, or 11 London time. Uh, I want to thank everyone for attending this Daily Effects European Desk Roundtable. As always, if you want to get in touch with us, feel free to join us in the real-time news feed uh, on StockTwits and Twitter. Um, at our various Twitter handles. I am at CVecchioFX. Uh, you have Martin is Martin S. Essex. And Nick, correct me if I'm wrong, it's at Nick Colley one That's correct, yeah. There we go. Um, later on today, of course, we have some key economic data coming out. Watch the calendar for the U.S. Consumer Confidence Report at 10 Eastern, 14 GMT. However, this is another one of those data that falls along the divide of soft data, which we know the United States has been quite from the soft data figures being sentiment surveys have shown that the US economy is you know roaring forward consumer confidence right now is at its highest levels since December 2000 the peak of the US tech bubble of course we know how that ended we'll see if actual hard data in the United States things like retail sales or trade balance uh, catch up over the next few weeks we have the trade balance and durable goods figures due on Thursday which in my opinion will carry a lot more weight given how investors have become so sensitive to this soft hard data divide. 
Um, otherwise, that's really it for us today. You can find out more information on when we'll be meeting again on the Daily Effects webinar calendar. You can access that by going to the top ribbon on the website, sliding over to calendar and clicking on webinar calendars. That'll bring you up the full slate of events going on today. My colleague David Song is meeting this morning at 9.45 Eastern and 13.45 GMT to discuss that U.S. Consumer Confidence Report. Be sure to join him there. Uh, listen again, it was a great pleasure speaking with you two gentlemen this morning. Hopefully our audience found this to be an informative session. We'll have the archive up on the Daily FX website shortly. If I don't get to speak to you before then, good luck trading the next few days and talk to you soon.